I'm not answering my phone. If I'm not active on social media, responding to my email, it's for one reason. Because I'm in the Wissahickon Valley, exploring 12,000 years of the great mystery of Philadelphia that's encoded in this sacred land. The Lenape tradition, colonial tradition, how it's all woven together right here in one mystical experience that I can only describe as the great mystery of Philadelphia. And that if one knows the great mystery of Philadelphia, yeah, that mystery of mysteries will help them penetrate most other. One of the things I like to do when I'm in the Wissahickon is try to the height of the land where your eye level with the treetops when i make it up to them heights i like to go to a special place known as where the rock and the treetop meet also known as lover's leap this one mystic place where the events that occurred here changed the course of the whole history of the americas it's a place where the queen mother goddess winona was assassinated by the colonial forces i come up here to give thanks pray and meditate one time while i was up here i heard i don't know how y'all see it but when it comes to the children who take us for the children so me being obedient I, you know, held that in my heaven, reflected on it, on my Sankofa journey home, tried I took, you know, walking forward but looking back and reflecting on the meditation I had. So coming back into Babylon, it's the usual entrance I take that leads me right to my neighborhood, Ritten House and Lincoln Drive, where there's an extension of the Wissahickon called Sailor Grove. And I recall that voice that told me, you know, before the children, and I have to admit, I am guilty of what I charge a lot of people not to do, which is take the public art and their reality for granted. Because this statue been here for a long time. And because it just like, looked like children playing with family, I never really paid any attention to it or took it for granted. But I paid attention to it. And what I, the little bit I could decode, troubled me. It seemed like it was depicting a pedo circle for a couple of reasons. One, the openness of the genitalia between the adults and the children. Really, they all seemed to be naked and what was uniting them was not clothes but like a cloak that covered their sacral chakra covered their sacral chakra but connected them to them the same way and another connecting point was their feet and so that made me really reflect on how the root word head is the root word for feet like pedestrian you know a pedestrian is one that uses their feet to walk but then head can also mean children like pediatrics medicine focusing on children and also pedophilia so it was a very bizarre statue and it made me feel like you know if nothing else i need to explore the artist and their portfolio and see what themes predominate in their art and so research this and found that the artist is actually Peter Rockwell. And so I decided to, you know, look into his portfolio. And yeah, his portfolio is pretty deep. It's pretty profound. The themes that you find in it, you know. And this is an image of Peter Rockwell. He was the son of the famous, iconic American artist, Norman Rockwell, whose art was on the cover of Saturday Evening Post for decades. Now, I am not claiming Peter Rockwell was either a victim nor perpetrator of pedophilic acts. However, I will say that many of the themes that you find in his art seem to have pedophilic themes. Let's look at the other piece of art that he has installed in Philadelphia. And you'll see that this is a predominant theme of his works, where he has multiple disassociated personalities represented in distorted facial mask conglomerated into one form that is usually a containing form such as a rectangle cube or box what is bizarre is that these uh pieces of his work are often designed to be climbable works of art and are installed in playgrounds and parks where children are encouraged to climb i would interpret that as many personalities in one container one body and trying to hold it in trying to hold in several different personas and characters some of them distorted some of them monstrous and trying to hold it all in while children playing around i don't know another thing you find in peter rockwell's work are monsters okay uh he actually created gargoyles for several 
Roman Catholic churches of Italy in his lifetime. He actually spent most of his life in Rome creating his sculptures. Another theme you find often in his works are one-eyed monsters with large mouths. Also voyeurs, gawkers, ones that the way their eyes are depicted, they're, you know, stalking, gawking, voyeurs, okay? So, yeah, very interesting themes seem to be present in this sculptor's artwork. You have entities that seem to be succubus, ones that would invade another's energy field and suck off of them. This is his largest art installation. It is a cross made for a convent that has depictions of the life of Christ on it. At the base of one side is his iconic monsters. On the other side, there's a devotee of the Christ in one scene, hugging the Christ in such a way it looks like she's giving him a blowjob, for lack of a better word. And this is something you find in his work often, ambiguity of what's going on. Is it plain or is it a sexual act? Here's a acrobatic depiction that, you know, angle and perspective is very important. But if you look at it from a certain way, it looks like they're performing uh, oral sex on each other. You know, what do you think? So, yeah, Peter Rockwell's art. Again, I'm not saying that Peter Rockwell was a pedophile or that he experienced pedophilia as a child. But what I must him say is that the way his art was, it caused me to really question this aspect of pedophilic art and pedophilic governance that we see in the news today, you know? I decided to use the lens of the Great Mystery Philadelphia to look at the theme of pedophilia in public art in Philadelphia and to see what it unfolds, you know, what it reveals. So take this journey with me, you know, as we look into this. I want to start where I usually do when I'm looking at decoding public art in Philadelphia. That's the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. We could characterize it as the classical reference point for decoding public art in Philly. If you can decode the mythical drama that's unfolding at the Philadelphia Museum of Art corresponding to the theme that you're researching, then you're going to find a lot. You're going to find very valuable information and insight into what you're looking into. Starting with the Philadelphia Museum of Art, we didn't even have to look far. We could start right at the rocky step to the statue that's to the left of the iconic rocky step. And that's the statue of Antinous as the lion slayer, the lion hunter. And this is a common uh, motif, a theme that you'll find the Roman god Antinous Osiris depicted as. So many people, particularly inclusion advocates, consider Antinous to be the god of homosexuality. I disagree. I would say Antinous is the god of pedophilia, the god of pederasty. Because when you know Antinous' story, he was a young boy, 12 to 13 years old, who lived in Anatolia, Byzantine, the Eastern Roman Empire. The Herculean Roman Emperor Hadrian saw Antinous and took him as his catamite. The catamite is a small boy that's used for sexual pleasure. And it is recorded that Hadrian took Antinous everywhere with him for approximately five years. And about five years in, well, I should say, while with Hadrian, Antinous engaged in a lot of what you would call heroic acts. One was hunting and slaying a lion that was terrorized Roman citizen in North Africa. And so that is what the statue of Antinous as the lion hunter is depicting, one of these heroic scenes. But after about five years, Antinous mysteriously died in Northern Egypt. Many speculated then and many speculate now that he was actually sacrificed by Hadrian in a ceremonial ritual act. And then afterwards immortalized into a demigod named Antinous Osiris. So now, if we explore a little more, look into the catalog of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, we find another very interesting piece that gives us major clues into what, you know, what is this pedophilia, pederasty, child sex abuse, child enslavement, child bondage that we see going on. Like, where, where, where are the roots of this thing? And the piece that gives us that insight is called Hercules at the Crossroad. So now those that interpret this say that, you know, this is Hercules at a major decision point in his life. He has to choose between pleasure or virtue, a life of pleasure and vice, or 
a life of service and virtue that, you know, will bring him great honor, okay? And so, again, at first glance, a casual glance, you will think he's choosing between these two women who appear in battle. But that is not true. All of them, the woman laying down with the satyr, as well as the woman who is about to take pleasure in chopping heads, all of them re represent pleasure. The road to virtue is to Hercules' right, and that road leads to the castle that's on the top of the hill. But what is that? The beginning of the road is a bound infant, a bound child, apparently running in fear from something that can't be seen. The child is also holding a dove, which says this was a sacrificial child. So the choice Hercules has to make that's between pleasure and virtue involves him choosing between the pleasures of women and the passion that they afford or with the virtue that comes with binding children in service to those who are in the castle. So that is Hercules at the crossroads. So that tells me that if we really want to know some of the mystical roots to this pedophilia, we have to look into the roots of Hercules that the god Hercules has something to do with this pedophilia, this pederasty, this binding of children and young people as a part of governance, pedophilic governance. Who is Hercules in mythology? I'm not going to get real deep. I recommend everyone research thoroughly Hercules and his place in mythology. But real quick, he's a half human, half God. Okay, so he's a Nephilim. He's a giant. He was one of those that were produced when the angels of heaven saw the daughters of man and thought that they were comely, thought that they were beautiful, and laid down with them and created giants who devoured the earth. So Hercules is one of these numbers. Hercules is hypersexual. Hercules will engage men, women, and children. He don't care. What is important else to know about Hercules is that in a fit of madness, he killed his wife and children. But Hercules did accomplish many labors, many amazing accomplishments on earth, which afforded him apotheosis upon death meaning Hercules was made a god and granted status on Mount Olympus. So now that's important because kings, war leaders, and other heroes of antiquity, they would often pray to Hercules for success and accomplishment in life. They felt without Hercules' favor, they'd not be able to reach immortal acclaim. They would not be able to achieve the heights of accomplishment and gather the amount of wealth and opulence and have the beautiful women around them needed that they were just saluted as a god, you know? So to win Hercules' favor, the leaders of ancient time would sacrifice their children to Hercules. And they did this because, again, the myth said Hercules killed his children. So to be Herculean, that's the sacrifice that it would take. So initially, in the early Her Herculean heroes, those Herculean kings and leaders, they sacrificed their own children. You read about King Cepheus of Ethiopia, he sacrificed his own daughter Andromeda to Hercules. The Herculean king, Lamadon of Troy, he sacrificed his daughter, Hesione, to Hercules. However, by the time Emperor Hadrian in the Roman era came, the one who they say sacrificed Antonus, yeah, Herculean heroes were sacrificing the children of others. So now, the most ancient Hercules, take it all the way back, it would be the Kemetic or Egyptian Netter, Egyptian god, Hereshaf. Hereshaf, or he who rules the lake, was a child of the Pharaoh in the early dynasties, in the first through seventh dynasties. And being a child of the Pharaoh, he was also known as he who ruled the lake. This was a very important lake of antiquity, Lake Meoris, located near where Abydos or Abju is. And this lake was a very important source of water and commerce, okay? So Hereshaf held significant prominence and influence in the Nile Valley for a very short era, what is known historically as the first intermediate period from about 21. 81 BC to 2055 BC, so approximately 120, 130 years, right? And this was a period where the Old Kingdom, which was based in Memphis or Menefer, 
they collapsed. And the rulers of the 20th known because they had the strategic location of, you know, occupying Lake Neoris, which connected the Mediterranean and Red Sea world. It gave them uh, the leverage needed to take over the entirety of Lower Kemet. So from, you know, what they called Heraclopolis, which was that 20th known, all the way north to the Mediterranean, uh, the rulers of Harishat gained control. So history notes that they were rather cruel rulers. There appears to be a lot of chaos associated with their time of rule. The historian Manetho says that during the rule of Harishath in the 7th and 8th dynasty, there were at least 70 pharaohs who each ruled for 70 days, you know? The 9th dynasty, which was also a dynasty of Harishath, those pharaohs were just recorded as being exceedingly evil, cruel, and violent. Okay. So much so that by time Mantu Hotep, the founder of the 11th dynasty, came to power in 2055. He started a expulsion campaign to rid the Nile Valley of the followers of Harishath, his priesthood, and those who ruled in his name. Okay? So the, the issue is, though, being one who ruled the lake, Harishath, they were skilled shipbuilders and they were skilled in navigation. So after they were expelled from the Nile Valley, Harishath established cities, outposts, colonies colonies throughout the Mediterranean world, particularly Eurasia, okay? Diodorus Siculus, in his Library of Histories, he described what is known historically as Heracleopolis Magna, what the great empire of Hercules, as stretching from the Pillar of Hercules in Iberia all the way to the Adriatic Sea, which is, you know, modern-day Turkey, and this Herculean empire encompassed much of Libya, or North Africa as well, okay? By the time of Ramesses II, the third pharaoh of the 19th dynasty he reinstituted harishaf worship in the nile valley so this happened around 1280 bce you know and yeah ramesses ii he ruled through heraculean labors and harishaf sacrifice and we will say that really except for the napatin or Mar marowetic period which lasted from about 900 bc to about 270 bc where uh, the rulers of Amun-Ra, the Theban, who had to retreat south to Napata and Meroe, except for their rule. Kemet was ruled by Pharaoh Zaharashat, all the way up to Alexander the Great and the Totni rule that began, you know, uh, around 350 BC. So now, the most ancient Hercules, we said it's, Her it's Harishat, right? But when he went beyond the Nile Valley, and established this uh, Heraclean empire. The different uh, colonies he created, they all gave Harishaf their own name. So the Harishaf colonists of Phoenicia called Harishaf Melkart. Babylonian ones called them, you know, ones in Persia, you know, uh, Middle East. They knew them as Moloch and Marduk, okay? And uh, Hebrew, he was known as Baal. Baal. Okay. Very important. These are all very important. So now, Diodorus gives us detail about the Herculean that colonized what we would call the Iberian Peninsula of Spain, Spain and Portugal, as well as how these Herculeans that colonized Iberia subsequently went up into Central Europe and you know, who these people became. And I think it's very important. I think these are the ones who you would say are the cultural heritage of a lot of what we're seeing today in regards to pedophilic governance. And they would be known as, uh, well, Diodorus uh, referred to them as Heraclean Greco Gauls. So we need to read about them. Diodorus records that after Hercules left the Straits of Gibraltar, he went up into Celtica and went to a great city named Elysia as a part of his campaign. And then it's further recorded that, you know, he actually founded the city there with a maiden who upon seeing Hercules was just, you know, overcome by his stature and countenance. And, you know, they laid down and had a child together. From the union of this woman from Elysia, Hercules had a son named Galates, who kind of built a community around this city Elysia and they became known as Gauls. Now let's look at this description of the Gauls. Let's read this account because it'll give us a lot of insight into the heritage that the ones who are conducting what we would call pedophilic governance, where they get their way of life from, where you know where their cultural heritage lays. The Gauls are tall of body with rippling muscles and white of skin and their hair is blonde and not only naturally so 
but they also make it their practice by artificial means to increase the distinguishing color which nature has given for they are always washing their hair with lime water and they pull it back from the forehead to the top of the head and back to the nape of the neck with the result that their appearance is like that of satyrs and pans since the treatment of their hair makes it so heavy and coarse that it differs in no respect from the mane of horses some of them shave the beard but others let it grow a little and the nobles shave their cheeks but they let the mustache grow until it covers the mouth consequently when they are eating their mustaches become entangled in the food and when they are drinking the beverage passes as it were through a kind of strainer the clothing they wear is striking shirts which have been dyed and embroidered in varied colors and breeches which they call in their tongue brocade and they wear striped coats fastened by a buckle on the shoulder heavy for winter wear and light for summer in which are set together checks close together and of varied hues the gauls are terrifying in aspect and their voices are deep and altogether harsh when they meet together they converse with few words and in riddles hinting darkly at things for the most part and using one word when they mean another and they like to talk in superlatives to the end that they may extol themselves and deprecate all other men they are also boasters and threateners and are fond of pompous language and yet they have sharp wits and are not without cleverness at learning among them are also to be found lyric poets whom they call bards these men sing to the accompaniment of instruments which are like lyres and their songs may be either of praise or a philosopher as we may call them and men learned in religious affairs are unusually humored among them and they are called druids the gauls likewise make use of diviners accounting them worthy of high approbation and these men foretell the future by means of the flight or cries of birds and of the slaughter of sacred animals and they have all the multitudes subservient to they also observe a custom which is especially astonishing and incredible case they are taking thought with respect to matters of great concern for in such cases they devote to death a human being and plunge a dagger into him in the region above the diaphragm and when the stricken victim has fallen they read the future from the manner of his fall and from the twitching of his limbs so here we have them recorded as you know committing human sacrifice as a way of foreseeing the future as well as from the gushing of the blood having learned to place confidence in an ancient and long continued practice of observing such matters and it is a custom of theirs that no one should perform a sacrifice without a philosopher one of the druid priests that they had mentioned earlier for thanks offering should be rendered to the gods they say by the hands of men who are experienced in the nature of the divine and who speak as it were the language of the god and is also through the meditation of such men they think that blessings likewise should be sought so here you have one of these druid priests overseeing the sacrifice and giving thanks offerings what was probably offered in, and and given in thanks the blood the women of the gauls are not only like the men in their great stature but they are a match for them in courage as well their children are usually born with grayish hair but as they grow older the color of their hair changes to that of their parents the most savage peoples among them are those who dwell beneath the bears and on the borders of Scythia and some of these we are told eat human being even as the britons do even as the britons do who dwell on iris as it is called and since the valor of these people and their savage ways have been famed abroad some men say that it was they who in ancient times overran all asia were called cimmerians time having slightly corrupted the word into the name cimbrians as they are now called for it has been their ambition from old to plunder invading for this purpose the lands of others and to regard all men with contempt for they are the people who captured rome 
who plundered the sanctuary at Delphi, who levied tribute upon a large part of Europe and no small part of Asia, and settled themselves upon the lands of the peoples they had subdued in war, being called in time Greco-Gauls. Very important. These are the people who we see how they're being described in ancient times as these Greco-Gauls that are, you know, carrying this heritage into today's time. And what we see is pedophilic governance because they became mixed with the Greeks and who, as their last accomplishment, have destroyed many large Roman armies. And in pursuance of their savage ways, they manifest an outlandish impiety also with respect to their sacrifices. For their criminals, they keep prisoner for five years and then impale in the honor of the gods, dedicating them together with many other offerings of first fruits and constructing piers of great size. Captives also are used by them as victims for their sacrifices in honor of the gods. Certain of them likewise slay together with the human beings, such animals as are taken in war or burn them or do away with them in some other vengeful fashion. And here we go. This is important. This 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 kind of ties ties in the pedophilia with all of this. Although their wives are comely, that means they're beautiful. They have very little to do with them, but rage with lust in outlandish fashion for the embraces of males. It is their practice to sleep upon the ground on the skins of wild beasts and to tumble with a catamite on each side. For those that don't know, a catamite is a small boy or a small child used for sexual pleasure. And the most astonishing thing of all is they feel no concern for their proper dignity, but prostitute to others without a qualm the flower of their bodies, nor do they consider this a disgraceful thing to do. But rather, when any one of them is thus approached and refuses to favor, refuses the favor, this is considered an act of dishonor. When we hear what was going on on Jeffrey Epstein's island, yeah, they were continuing this tradition of the Greco Gauls, described pretty clearly by Diodorus. Okay, so let's let's explore these Heraclean greco gauls a little if, if you remember one of the patched passages of theodorus it said for they are the ones who captured rome who plundered the sanctuary at delphi so one of the things these greco gauls did probably in acts of contempt and mockery of the oracle at delphi which was a matriarchal oracle they took on the name delphi Okay. How do we know Delphi was a matriarchal oracle? Because Delphi means of the womb. So yeah, it was a temple of the womb. So obviously the people with wombs, the woman, the womb man, were the keepers of the temple at Delphi. But when these Greco Gauls ran through it, they, they co-opted the name Delphi. And that came down in what we would call French history. Because right, the Gauls are the ancestors of what we would generally say the French Parisians, okay? French Parisians of today are the Gauls of Theodorus' time. And these Greco Gauls, having conquered the Temple of Delphi, their nobility adopted the name Dauphin, which basically means Dauphin, right? So these Dauphins were a noble class of friends. And in the 1300s, they worked closely with the House of Lorraine Habsburg Gotha and overthrowing the House of Bourbon and expanding the Roman Empire. So, Dolphins, I mentioned, they claim as their heritage the oracles of Delphi, but they also claim heritage back to another Greek Herculean leader, and his name was Ptolemy Philadelphus. So, Ptolemy Philadelphus, he was one of the sons of Ptolemy the First, who was a general of Alexander the Great. He adopted the name Philadelphus, which basically means lover of his siblings, lovers, lover of those from his same womb that he was from. Yeah, he got that name because he had the gall, had the audacity to marry his own sister. So this was a very, again, a very Herculean pharaoh of Kemet, okay? You could say his reign marked the height of Hellenistic Greece. He built Pharaoh's Lighthouse, which was uh, at one time one of the wonders of the world. He also built a university and a library in Alexandria. This was the library 
of Alexandria that was burnt down by Julius Caesar. It was built by this man, Ptolemy Philadelphia. Even though his name meant sibling lovers, he was a wild boy. He wasn't universal with that love. In his uh, quest to gain control of his father's empire, which again included Kemet or Egypt, but also extended up into Lebanon, Syria, all up in there, as well as different parts of Libya. In his effort to gain control of the territory, two of his brothers were killed. But then again, he married his sister, Arsinoe II, consolidating power. He did that in 273 BC. And yeah, just as outlandish as it sounds now, it was considered outlandish in Hellenistic Greece in contemporary times. He justified it by saying that Zeus and Hera were brother and sister and they got married, as well as citing many of the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty of Kemet, particularly Hepsetsha and Tutmosis, that they were brother and sister who got married. It was still weird. Around that same time, Ptolemy II was actively engaged in transforming the what you would call the state religion of Hellenistic Greece and Lower Kemet, right? Which at this time was worshipping Alexander the Great as a Herculean god. Uh, he transformed that cult into a cult that recognized the whole Ptolemaic dynasty, himself included, his father included, his sister included, into Herculean worship. As a part of that, 272 BCE, Ptolemy II promoted himself and his sister wife, Arsinoe, to divine status the Theo Adelphi, the sibling gods. Around the same time, Ptolemy was sponsoring translation of old text, old scriptures into Greek to go into his newly founded library at Alexandria. This right here, this fact right here, this act right here, this is the ultimate root of what we would call the great mystery Philadelphia, okay? Because this was when prophecy of the Church of Philadelphia was created, where in Revelations chapter 3, you have this message to the seven churches, and only one church receives a benevolent prophecy. It was at this point that Ptolemy II, Ptolemy Philadelphus, had himself and his whole family, his whole community, which in Revelations became known as the Church of Philadelphia, that this was the one community, the one church, that received a benevolent prophecy of experiencing grace on Judgment Day. It is in this context that we have a man named Ben Franklin, who, when you look at his heraldry, claims as his heraldry, the dolphin. You look at the Franklin family crest, you see the dolphin, the dolphin symbol, is central to the crest. When you look at the University of Pennsylvania, established in 1740 by Ben Franklin, you see the dolphin on the seal, okay? And so it is in this context that Ben Franklin, the dolphin, who Herculean labors, creates Philadelphia, or this community that are the descendants of Ptolemy Philadelphia, that they create a community that's going to receive the grace on Judgment Day. And then we have to see that just as Hercules traveled the globe performing many labors, that's how Ben Franklin as the Herculean God of Philadelphia, how he's depicted. And ultimately, he is depicted as like a mirror image of Ptolemy Philadelphia, who enlarged the Greco-Gaul Empire through establishing universities and libraries. And those are one of the two biggest things Ben Franklin did. University create the University of Pennsylvania and the Free Library of Philadelphia. These are the 12 labors of Hercules. A couple of them kind of mirror things that Franklin is you know, kind of given credit for. Hercules stole golden apples from the Hesperides. This, the Hesperides is the American. So stealing the wealth, plundering the abundance, the cornucopia of goodness of this abundant land mirrors Her Her one of Hercules's acts. They say Hercules cleaned out the Aegean sta stables in a day by changing the course of a river. The Ben Franklin Parkway culminates the memorialization of Philadelphia Waterworks, which changed the course of the Schuylkill River to clean up shitty Philadelphia. Other things that Hercules did, he spawned hundreds of nations, and Ben Franklin is considered the first American. Hercules also freed Prometheus from the vulture in exchange for electric fire. And anyone who's been studying my great mystery Philadelphia works, that's something that we know that Ben Franklin did that, and that is what we know of as him flying the kite to discover electricity. So you have several Herculean depictions of Ben Franklin throughout Philadelphia. Again, making him the Heraclean god of this city. Here you have young Franklin, the Herculean wanderer. Here's Ben Franklin, the Herculean printer. Here's Ben Franklin on a bench with a newspaper. 
as well as a cane cane anytime you see cane they're working with the craft so he's the crafter here he is as ben franklin as the crafter of public opinion not only printing the press but writing the opinions contained within it here's ben franklin with the kite the thief of fire from heaven for the betterment of mankind that is the hercules prometheus myth and this myth is also uh, embodied with the lightning kite statue at franklin square and here's franklin as the statesman who founded the nation who crafted the nation you see uh, again he has another wand or staff along with this uh, it should be stated that ben franklin was the only founding father to have signed all four key documents establishing the united states declaration of independence 1776 treaty alliance with france 1778 treaty of paris 1783 and the u.s constitution 1787 and again we already mentioned this ben franklin is also hercules who frees prometheus which allows him to strangle the vulture another thing ben franklin did was open the gates of hell as the thinker here's the thinker on ben franklin parkway opening the gates of hell Herculean inside how do we know here is the gates of hell how do we know franklin opened it you see there's a microcosmic image of the thinker resting atop of the actual gate okay manifesting all kinds of mayhem and fuckery around him that actually is what opens the gates how would we say he did it sacrificing women and children remember by the time of hadrian and antinous it was the women and children of others that heraclean men in pursuit of being being becoming a heraclean god would sacrifice so here we have an up close panel of what's on the outside of the gates of hell okay and you see it's a compilation of mutilated sacrificed women and children so i know some might be shocked at thinking of ben franklin in that light but you can't forget that in london franklin was a member of the hellfire club and his residence at 36 craven street when it was remod remodeled in 1998 10 bodies six children four adult women were found buried in the basement and Here's one of the last Herculean representations of Ben Franklin. We'll look at him being apothesized or made into a god. Yeah, and, and he's made a god for ultimately resurrecting Rome in the Americas. And here's a list of some of the other Herculean feats Ben Franklin did for Philadelphia. Again, we mentioned the library as well as all the different experiments he did. So we see that Ben Franklin is the Herculean god of Philadelphia. But who is the Herculean god of the nation? It's pretty obvious, none other than your boy George Washington. The Washington Square of Philadelphia, George Washington at a tomb of the unknown soldier. This is his most uh, common depiction. When we look at this statue and decode this statue, this is how Washington, again, beyond being depicted here in Philadelphia in Washington Square. He's also depicted like this in the state capital of Virginia, as well as the state capital of South Carolina. Yeah, this, this statue needs to be decoded because one of the ways to interpret this statue, and again, we didn't go into detail of it, but Hercules was a flagrant homosexual who had several chronicle homosexual encounters. It wasn't looked at as being unmanly, but just again, a part of being Herculean. So let's decode this statue and, and, and see what are, what are they saying about George so in his right hand is a cane okay we talked about that symbolism as someone who is into the craft his left arm his feminine arm is resting on a partially cloaked bundle of sticks and when you look up what is a bundle of sticks it's called a fasces this is the symbol for fascism but another name for fasces is a fat which a faggot in German means a bundle of sticks. And a bundle of sticks was associated with these Greco Gaul Herculean leaders who took pleasure in meting out pain in homosexual or pederastic grown man to little child sexual acts. His pose, the way Washington is standing, is called contrapusta. And this is the pose for androgyny or bisexuality in classical art. Prior to Contraposta, classical art was depicted either koros for male or kore for female. So this pose, if it was properly decoded, would say Washington was kind of an undercover fact, at least bisexual, and it was partially cloaked, meaning some people knew, not all but some. And when you take this depiction into account and you really read George Washington's life biography, 
does raise the question about his relationship with who was known as Billy Lee. Okay, so Billy Lee, he was owned by Washington, and I do think he was considerably younger than George Washington. He was at what was called a mulatto slave. Washington employed him more like a personal assistant, and he was the only one of George Washington's 124 enslaved humans that Washington freed immediately in his will. So when you read about Willie Lee, he served Washington in a variety of roles. He went with him everywhere. He was in every battle George Washington engaged in during the uh, War of Independence. He was with, he accompanied Washington in all of his travels as president. He was Washington's valet or manservant. And as manservant, Lee's chores included brushing Washington's long hair and tying it behind his head and making sure he was dressed and attired properly. And again, out of Washington had 124 enslaved when he passed at the time of his passing. Willie, Billy Lee, Willie Lee was the only one freed immediately upon Washington's death. All the rest, their ownership was transferred to Washington's wife, Martha. Billy Lee was given a pension of $30 a year for the rest of his life and was allowed to live on Mount Vernon, which he did until the day he died. To me, that's easy mathematics. One plus one equals two, you know? Y'all do the math. But now, deeper Herculean symbolism we find of George Washington often is what's called the apotheosis of Washington. When you study this statue and compare it to uh, classical statues that this one was modeled on, all you can say is they're depicting George Washington as Marduk by any other name. So this is the statue of Washington ascending into heaven as Hercules, where you find the most commonly referenced image of Washington as Marduk. And this is the this is the painting that's on the Capitol Dome, okay, of the apotheosis of George Washington, him ascending into the heavens. He's got Columbia, the war goddess, to his side. But again, when we look at ancient renditions, it's Marduk by any other name. And we already said Hercules is bald. He's also Marduk. And again, when we encounter this pedophilic governance, these ones who want to be the leader, they want to be the decision maker for the United States, and they're sacrificing children or sacrificing the lives of others to get to that place. Who are they sacrificing to? This is an important question to answer because it really shows the continuity of this behavior. This is nothing new. What the only difference now is that people are becoming more aware of. So now, where did the structure, where did the organized structure of this, where are the roots of the organized structure of child trafficking? I think we need to go back to this guy, okay? Benjamin Rush. Those who saw my other video, America's First Plandemic, they're familiar with this guy. Benjamin Rush was a wild, wild boy. An organization he and his wife were a part of, the Orphan Society of Philadelphia, started in 1814. This was the nation's first privately funded orphanage. I think the roots of organized child trafficking start here. But a big part of a child becoming in of becoming into this Orphan Society of Philadelphia, they had to be bound. They were called bound or, you know, indentured in service any Anywhere from five to seven years. In 1848, this organization did something very strange. They started funneling children to Girard College the very first year it opened up. Again, that being 1848. Now I told you, anyone who saw my pandemic video, they know Stephen Girard and Benjamin Rush. They were probably co-conspirators in America's first pandemic, the yellow fever outbreak of 1793. I strongly encourage everyone, if you haven't, to go and check that out. In 1812, Stephen Girard was the one man in history who could say they alone exclusively own the United States. Again, to see how he put himself in this position, check out the pandemic video. But what he did, one of the things he did with that was starting in the 1830s, he started financing most railroad projects in the United States. He used his financing as decision-making leverage to kind of dictate where the rail lines would be laid. And of course, they went to properties, a lot of the properties that he owned. 1848, Stephen Gerard opened Gerard College, and Gerard College became the United States' first de facto orphan train operation. We say de facto because it wasn't called that as such, even though it operated that way as such. And when you study Gerard College down in North Philly, two things stand out. One is that tracks, train, rail, trolley, urban train tracks 
surround the entire campus. The other thing that you notice are the massive walls. Yeah, when you really study the history of Girard College, it's very nefarious. Girard, again, wanted to present himself as a philanthrop and that these were philanthropic works, but it seems like he created a system starting in 1848 where he would get orphans funneled to him by Benjamin Rush and the orphanage society that he founded. They would give them some training on campus, specifically training that would make someone a good frontiers person, survive in the Midwest, and then he would ship them by train out to the Midwest and bind them to usually affluent families, but at times families go through any assessment, just fate. They needed a young person for labor or whatever and were able to get one of these orphan children bound to them for five years. So this is the Herculean depiction of Stephen Gerard on his campus. This this representation reminds it's I see similar themes to the very first statue uh, that we were looking at, Children at Play, that even got us on this quest, where here's Stephen Gerard at the pinnacle of a circular pedestal, a tiered pedestal, and the pedestal is accentuated. Also so when you look at the children, each of the children, their feet are, something is bringing the attention to their feet in some way. So is this another uh, language of the muses, a way of saying that this was a pedophile ring or pedophile circle? I know art is for interpretation. What do you think? So again, 1840s, Stephen Gerard is jumping this off. 1850s, you have the orphan train movement officially beginning in New York. And from 1854 to 1929, about 200,000 on the books. Children who were orphaned were shipped out west, you know, placed in these foster home scenarios in, in rural Midwest communities, bound from five to seven years. And yeah, for many, it was like slavery. It was, you know, no rights to be recognized other than the people they were bound to gave them. And again, the prototype of this was started at Girard College. Fast forward to contemporary times. Orphan trains ended about 1929 when automobiles and other more efficient means of transportation evolved, as well as the West already being what you might say one, and, and there was less of a need to send people to populate the West. Europeans send Europeans to populate the West. You then had the child trafficking evolved and this gives a whole nother context to the boys town incident of franklin nebraska where you had this ring of of pedophiles who were affluent business men and politicians of nebraska who would bring young boys to washington dc for prostituting them off to government officials here here it is again this is her heraculean pedophilia pedophilic governance great mystery philadelphia's angle on this gives a much clearer angle to what it is we're looking at and then you know why is all of this relevant because it does show a continuity to what we're seeing today with Jeffrey Epstein, Hillary Clinton, allegations. Food for thought, hope it's digestible. Definitely recommend getting Great Mystery Philadelphia. So when you see public art in your community, you had the keys to know how to decode it. Yes, I give thanks. Redemption is a serious thing The need to be redeemed is so much pain What you are still seeing in the world Wearing so many layers of their built up experience Some not so good to say Some not so good to say Hearing our realities together are known to us. Oh, archetypal heroes and villains and sheroes and all. Archetypal heroes and sheroes and villains and shatters and all. Actors and actresses caught in your roles. That's what they call on you to play. In everyday life, the same way. What when you know that's not who you really are? When your sight set, that's not what you would ideally say. When they give you no chance to redeem your way, 
That's how man hardened into cruelty and stay, 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 stay. Redemption is a serious thing. You need to be redeemed. It's so much pain. Well, let's not see it in the world. We're with so many layers of built up experience. Some not so good to say. Some not so good to say. Here in our realities together run on to us. Oh, archetypal heroes and villains and shatters and all. Actors and actresses, they caught in your roles. That's what they call on you to play In everyday life, the same way When you don't know, that's not who you really are Why? When your sight set, that's not what you would ideally say They give you no chance to redeem your way You satter into cruelty and stay That's how they stay Redemption, that's a serious thing. Redemption, a serious thing. Need to be redeemed, is so much pain. See it in the world. We're in every layer of built up experience. Some not so good to say. Not so good to say. Just fear our realities together on to us. Hey, hero, hero, and all. Archetypal shatters of villain and heroes and all. Hey, actors and actresses, you're trapped in your roles. That's what they call on you to play. In everyday life, the same way. From you don't know, that's not who you really are. And when your sight says, that's not what you would ideally say. But now they give you no chance to redeem your way. That's how man hardened into cruelty and stay. Stay Stay here. Look where they want to stay. Stay here. John, that's the thing, yeah, that's the serious thing, the need to be redeemed, yeah, yeah, you know, that's right, you know, that's not who you are, you sight said that's not what you would ideally say. They give you no chance to redeem your way. The children harden it to cruelty and stay.